I uh, brought my book. A couple people have asked for it. R.G. Lee, when he wrote this, place, this book called A Place Called Heaven, um, I only disagree with him on one point. And uh, I think it's because he just didn't think about it. But he said the only thing that we're going to take to uh, heaven from this earth would be music. That would be something that we have down here that we would take to heaven, which would be music. I actually think that uh, we gotta take, we're going to take something else with us, of which I'll tell you about in a little bit. But uh, I wonder if um, the music that we have um, down here, you know, we only got seven notes, right? Um, I, I asked a, a question one time of a professor in music if um, how many notes we would have when we get to heaven. Well, of course, they, all, they just said seven because that was the perfect one. It repeats all over. Like the colors. You know, we've got a certain amount of colors. Now, I'm not talking about Crayola. Y'all remember the boxes that had all the different colors in it? But there's really just the, the colors that are there. So I, I said, well, maybe God's holding back. Maybe in this finite mind that we have, we can only comprehend so much. And uh, in uh, R.G. Lee, in his book, he was talking about Beethoven and Mozart and all the ones who did all the wonderful things that were there that we uh, enjoy so very much. And uh, I'm thinking, well, there are songs that we've never heard. There are things that are beyond. And I just think that um, God cannot be confined Amen? I think that's almost a definition of, of we can try to confine God, but God is so much beyond all of that. So uh, when we get to glory, we're going to see him for the first time for who he really is. The totality of God. We get a glimpse of a partial part of it now. If we talk about love, uh, I did marriage counseling yesterday and, and I was... Uh, third time we've been trying to define what true love really is and but you can you can get all of that down here and it still just be a a representation of the true love that we'll know of when we see God so when we see God it won't be by faith and it will not be in this finite understanding of of how we can see things now but it will will we will see the fullness of God and his glory in heaven amen if y'all are okay with it, uh, let's do the prayer request at the end. Y'all all right with that? Let me just pray, and uh, we're going to begin, and we'll go from there. Let's pray. Father, uh, tonight I pray that uh, you, will, you gave us your word. You gave us this word, and you gave it to us so that we would know what's happening now and to dispel our fear what would come in the future, uh, how you've got this. And how you've got us in this. So Lord, uh, comfort our souls. Comfort our thoughts. Uh, comfort our spirits with your, the trueness of who you are. And Lord, if I know tonight we're only going to get to see a part. And I don't have all the answers. Because your word does not fully describe all of it. But Lord, let us just take the words that you have given us that are for our benefit now. And Lord, let them uh, be the seed the mustard seed of what will come later. Uh, and I think of our loved ones that are, uh, even now at this moment, as we are still veiled in time, but they're in your presence of eternity, and they're seeing so much more, so much more, so much more. So Lord, I, I thank you for New Holland Baptist Church. I thank you for the people, the precious people that make up New Holland Baptist Church. I thank, of their, thank you for the love that they have for you, and, and uh, the love that you have for them, and Lord, for our mission here to bring you honor and glory. So Lord, just uh, bless our time together, and uh, may it all be about you, Lord. Draw us close. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation 21. Um, for anybody who wants to read this sermon, I'm going to let you do it. But you're going to have to do it one at a time. And y'all got to take good care of this because this thing's older than I am. Um, and 
once you read this and the people who do read this will testify, I have not tried to copy anything <laughs> in here. Uh, Adrian Rogers was Dr. Lee's pastor. After uh, Dr. R.G. Lee was at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, after him came the great Ramsey Pollard. And he was there, I think, for about eight years. And then he went off and... Uh, uh, and by the way, Ramsey was a phenomenal man of God, but the people at Bellevue weren't too sure about him because he was an R.G. Lee. And it's hard to follow somebody that's such a, a great man of God. And then after uh, Dr. Potter left, he went to Oklahoma, and I think he ended up being the president of the convention there and just a, a great man in the Southern Baptist Convention. Adrian Rogers came, and he was a pastor at uh, Belvis, ba Bellevue, Bellevue Baptist in Memphis. And uh, so they uh, became great friends, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Lee. And uh, Dr. Uh, Lee, in his last days, uh, had a vision of heaven. Had a vision of heaven. Kind of, I guess you could almost say like God did for uh, the Apostle John in the book of the Revelation. So, of course, Dr. Rogers wanted to ask him about it. And he said, uh, he said Dr. Lee had the clearest, bluest eyes and he was, uh, uh, he said, uh, Dr. Lee, could you tell me something? And he said, oh, it was beyond anything that my words could ever, could ever share. Now, if y'all ever get the pr privilege of reading some of his stuff, his words were phenomenal. So phenomenal. But he said, my words would not uh, be able to share of the glory and the splendor of what I saw. And then Dr. Rogers said, well... Is there some way when you go to glory that we could take your brain and put it in my head? And Dr. Lee said, that would be like taking a beautiful grand piano and put it in the closet. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to try to uh, share any of all of these, but I'm going to read to you a couple things that describe. And actually, what I'm going to read to you is mostly Dr. Lee quoting other men and their explanation of a grasp of a view of heaven. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, um, maybe you've read some of E.M. Bounds. He wrote a lot on prayer, E.M. Bounds. Here, Dr. Lee is quoting him. All figures and values and beauty are exhausted in description. Earthly and angelic vocabularies are exhausted, and yet only the outside is described. Isn't that amazing? We're going to talk about that city four square tonight. And true enough, in Revelation 21, when it describes the city, it only describes the outside. It describes nothing of the inside. Bounds says, what there is of wealth and good inside defies all language to convey, all beauty to describe. And to that, now we say, drat. But when we get there, we'll say amen. Amen. We want to know more, don't we? But we couldn't comprehend. Uh, Bishop Bacon, he quotes in saying, In describing the celestial world of light and life and love, all thought, all language, all image fails us. It is a theme too high for conception, too grand for description, too sacred for comparison. The grandeur of nature, the glory of art, the charm of fancy, the creation of poetry, all these fade in the vision. And then he says, this is Lee's words, and I speak to you of heaven. I feel when I attempt to describe it as one who would forth, who forth, excuse me, as one who goes forth with flickering and feeble candle to illuminate a sunset. Or one who toils with a wheelbarrow to haul away in one day all the golden wheat of all the western plains. As one who with a teacup works to catch and hold Niagara's waters. As one who with a thumbnail mirror attempts to catch and reflect the wonders of a mighty ocean. The woeful sense of inadequacy that expresses me to, is akin to the feeling expressed in Lee Hunt by Shelby. I do not write. I have lived too long near Lord Byron, and the sun has extinguished the glow worm. In all of these things, 
I take on tonight the, the chance to describe what John saw and what God desired for John to pen of what he saw when he looked and saw the city four square coming down. I want to read it to you, begin in verse 4. We covered this Sunday morning, but I just want to remind you of one phrase there. Revelation 21 verse 4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, nothing else that will ever make you sad. There will be no more death, no separation at all, only eternal abiding. Nor sorrow, your heart will simply overflow with the good and the love and the peace that God gives you. No crying, no, for there will be no more pain, no trace of sin whatsoever. Then he says these, for the former things have passed away. One must go away that the new can come. When Jesus went to the cross, it was for a reason and a purpose. His life must pass away so that something greater could come. As we look at this earth today, we sorrow. I, I sorrow with my brother Charles tonight. Seven years ago, his wife passed away today. And I, we have to say goodbye to one thing before we can say hello to something else. This world of sin that we call home, that we're very comfortable with, that people long for and seek to hold to, must pass away. The former things must pass away. I want to tell you that our thoughts that we think are the great values of heaven will be replaced with something so much greater. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It actually means that it is better. Our comprehension of what we think is one thing, but our understanding of what we will inherit will be so much more grand. So I want you to, to, to think about when we, we talk about these things tonight, though we can't fully understand them in this veil, this tent, this, this earthly tabernacle, this earthen jar, this will go away, and that's a good thing, right? Right? There's so many things down here that people are holding dear to, but we will, we, will, we will gratefully let those things go so that something else can take its place, all right? So in verse 5, he said to him, write, for these words are true and faithful. You need to understand that what he has promised us are true, and he is the faithful witness. He has the power to hold those things and to keep those things for us. I've been asked many times, why it is that Satan fights so hard? He's a defeated foe. Surely he knows that. I don't think he does. He is fighting for his life. And he understands that God is light, so he holds to darkness. He understands that God is good, so he seeks to, to, to try to defeat that good with bad. He understands that we live in time. We of all people should have every daily thought looking towards eternity. But Satan wants us to hold to the, the things of right now as if that were everything. He, he fights for the temporal because he uses the temporal as a weapon against the eternal, the permanent. The vast goodness that God has prepared for us. So why would, after a thousand years, in a bottomless pit, chained with someone else in control, why would he, when, when he's been given the opportunity to leave, why would he go back to the old way? Why would he fight against the light of God again? Why would he seek to, once again, be the accuser of God, the deceiver of the brethren, and bring a rebellion against all that is good and holy? Why would he? Because that's all he has. 
there's a simple statement that I think that we need to hold to. Instead of yelling at lost people, just understand, lost people act like lost people. I love the fact that little children run around the church. I love the fact that they speak when they're not supposed to. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I love the fact that they only can speak the truth, you know. Well, they can speak lies. But, but, but they, they, they tell the truth when, when parents are like, shh, 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 shh. Right? Because that's just who they are. We should love them for that. Please understand and know that though he came to fight, he should have come back and said, God, I give. You're right. But there was something in him that could not or would not ever see the grandeur of the presence of who God really is. And that will cost him everything. I said all that to say this. People ask me the question, why do people not humble themselves, confess their sin, repent of it as best they can before a holy God, look to God and say, you're right, I'm wrong, you're the, you're the Savior of the world, the Creator and the Holder of all. I give my heart, my life, my all to you. Because there's something in them that puts them above the Almighty. When we get to heaven, the one thing that will make heaven heaven is God. The one thing that will make it where we would never want to ever leave is the glory of God fully revealed in our hearts and in our lives. Look what it says. Verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He shall be my son. Verse number 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me a great, the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. When we get to see God at, with the, and, and know him fully, the thing that will be so amazing is we'll see the glory of God. When... Moses got to see a glimpse of it. It changed him. God's holiness came off on him. And you've been around good. How many of y'all, y'all know, know exactly what I'm talking about. You probably are thinking of someone when I say this. When you were around them, you, you sensed and you felt the presence of God on that person. They had been around God. It was like the, the glory of God was in that person. And when you were around that person, you sensed and you felt the presence of God on that person. The thing that will make heaven heaven is Jesus will be there with all of his glory. But hear this now. He's not a hoarder of his glory. He's a giver of his glory. Jim, you get all of it. From the moment you're there, you never have to leave the presence of his glory, the presence of his goodness, the presence of the bliss of his love. The glory of God is what's going to make it so absolutely unique and wonderful. It talks about it in verse, uh, verse 11. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. This is a diamond. A diamond shining in brightness and brilliance. Everything that we're going to talk about in the next few moments, there are going to be different descriptions of this beauty. And though it is difference in the, can I say, the fragrance of it, or I'll even use the word color, but it's all brilliant in itself. So much beyond the, the, the vagueness of it here. What we have now is a, fore, a foretaste of what we will experience there. So we'll see love to the nth degree, but everything to that place. This city was most brilliant from the glory of God. Verse 12, let's get into some new language here. She had a great and high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates, names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes 
of the children of Israel. Let me go a little further just so that you can kind of have the understanding of this. Verse 13, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, okay? 12 gates, 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with its reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. This city, someone said, well, this is like a pyramid. No, 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 no. This is like a cube. Now, here is the, the length in the, in the description of how we could understand it. We in America go by miles. This is a city that is 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. Now, I don't have a great way of describing this, so let me just uh, use someone else's terms. From the tip of Maine to the tip of Florida, 1,500 miles. From the East Coast to Colorado, 1,500 miles. And take that 1,500 miles high. You say, well, I can't understand that. Well, let's just say each, let's say that in this city, I hadn't been inside it, I don't know. I'm just trying to describe, okay? Let's say in each floor of that, that uh, city was one mile high. I don't know. Down here we'd say a, a floor is what, 12 feet, something, 15 foot? I don't know. Some say 10, I don't know. We'll let the people who build the skyscrapers tell us that, right? But let's, say, let's just for conversation say, say it's one mile. That's 1,500 stories if they were all one mile. Now, people brighter than me said, well... We have 7 billion people on the earth at this point if all of them were saved, and we know that's not true. Can I get an amen? But if they were in this city, it would only be one small part of that cube. And they tried to figure out how many people that would be on it, and basically that's a, that's a, it's, it's, it's a futile concept because we don't know how it looked inside. All we know is this, it's 1,500 miles wide, long, and high. Amen? The wall of this city is not a wall that goes up and, and just uh, protects it from an outer layer, no. It's a cube. It goes around it, so to speak. So when you look at it, this wall is 216 feet thick. And in this wall, there is on the north side, three gates. On the east side, three gates. On the south side, three gates. On the west side, three gates. Now here, let me... <clears throat> For, for time's sake, can I just talk? All right. Let's talk about the gates. It says that these gates have the name of the children of Israel on them. The 12 tribes of Israel are on the gates. Isn't it funny how Abraham was given this and he was looking for a city who, which had foundations whose author and, or maker and builder is God? It has 12 gates, and it has their names, and the gates are made of a pearl. <clears throat> All the other things that are the materials that are described to us, especially we'll talk about the, the foundations in verse 19 and 20. There are 12 foundations that are 12 stones. All of those are materials. Stones, right? We got that part. We're going to talk about the, the gold uh, Streets that are gold, pure gold, that's a, that's a material. We understand that. But a pearl comes from a live animal. It's the only thing that does. It's in our heaven. And a pearl comes from an oyster. 
And basically how a pearl is made is a grain of sand will get inside the oyster and scar it, hurt it, wound it. And a healing salve will begin to build around the wound. And over time, that's how the pearl is formed. The pearl begins with a wound. But the healing of the wound creates the pearl. And it says in his description of his heaven that the gate is made of a pearl. When you come through that pearly gate, we ever sung about that before? When we go through the pearly gates, we're going to understand that we're entering the city through the wound of someone else. By the way, whose wound was that be, would that be? Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. By his stripes, we are healed. Right? He did that for us, and the healing balm that was built around that. Now, that's, that's, that's the entrance into the city. And it's, oh, it's so much more than I could ever possibly understand. And you could probably teach me so much more. But, but it's, it's built on, on, on the, the, the people that were supposed to be God's people. God's chosen people. The, to, to Abraham, this promise was given. His son Isaac. His son Jacob, by the way, study Jacob. He was a scoundrel. Aren't you grateful that God loves scoundrels? A schemer. One who, one who was looking for and received a second chance. Praise God that we serve the God of the second chance. The one who could take one who only cared about himself and made him the father of the ones who would be the, the 12 tribes. And by the way, Study the 12 tribes. Study those 12 guys of those 12 tribes. They're not the, they're not the highest caliber of people too. Amen? God is the God. What was it Lincoln said? No, no, I believe it's Twain. God must love the common person because he made so many of us. I believe that was Mark Twain. Amen? Somebody will tell me if I, if I said it incorrectly. Isn't it funny how God chose them and he puts their name because they came to God believing, trusting. The foundation going towards. The foundation that opens the door. And then when we get into the city, we see all of these, these um, well, let's talk about the construction. Verse number 18. The construction of its wall was of jasper, that is the diamond. The city was pure gold like clear ga uh, glass. Clear. Go to Ezekiel, the first three chapters, and study it, and you'll see the throne that is there, and the throne is there, and those that are under the throne, and they can see above it because it's clear. Go to Revelation 4 and see the throne that is there, and those that are around, the sea of glass, like crystal, that is there. And we're looking at gold. When, I, when, when, when Lynn bought me my wedding band, we decided, you know, now they're making them silver. Now they're making them titanium. Uh, now they're making them rubber. Y'all seen the rubber ones? Stretch those things on. Um, she said, uh, I'm going to get you a nice one. I'm going to get you 18 carat or something. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want 18 carat. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, no, 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 it's too soft. I said, I want something. So I, got, I asked for 10 carat because I needed something harder. I wanted something, and by the way, y'all know when she put it on, it hadn't been back off. It's never been back over that knuckle. And I got calluses all around that thing, and, and she put an inscription on the inside of it, and I'd have to ask her what it was, because I don't know that I remember all it. It's written down somewhere, but I haven't seen it since then. But all the impurities that are there lessen the quality of it. The, the more pure it gets, the more... The more, you know, the higher quality of it. You got, you got to put it in the crucible and put the heat to it and to separate the pure gold from, the, from the, all the impurities, right? And it'll get clearer the more you get to it, right? This gold is 
like the, I, I said all that to say this, this goat is a, is a representation of everything that else is in heaven, which is pure. There is nothing in heaven that has any impurities whatsoever. Y'all good with that? Let me tell you why that should matter to you now. Right now in this world, we see a lot of impure motives, don't we? We still see a lot of impure thoughts, don't we? Have, have any of y'all had impure thoughts today? But you're in church tonight worshiping to God and, and saying, I, I, I pray that I never have those impure thoughts ever again. But when we get there, there'll be nothing impure. Everything that you see is pure. Now, how many of you know some people that are dirty, rotten scoundrels, saved by grace? Amen? So when you see them with the blood of Jesus Christ covering them and they are made white as snow, what are you going to know about them? Pure. When you look at me today, you see human Brian. When you look up, when you see me in heaven, and if you make it, I'll be there, right? You'll see the, the pure Brian. So many people are wondering about how can it be that, you know, what will it be like? They're trying to transition what we are now and take the things of earth with us. Well, obviously we know we can't take the things of earth with us. Then let the other stuff go. Let it go. Well, I was hurt. I don't want to speak to that person. I don't want to talk to them on earth, and I'm not going to talk to them in heaven. You're going to have a tough time. Because the only thing we're going to have in heaven is pure. Everything will be made one with God. The glory of God will be everywhere. Let's talk about it. Uh, uh, you may want to ask me about the, the different precious stones that are in verse 19 and verse 20. And, and let me just tell you this. I don't know. Y'all good with that? If you, wanna, if you want me to give you a description of why he chose these, I, I don't know. I just know these are the ones that he gave us. Is that fair? I think one of the craziest things that I've ever seen is people trying to talk about things and things that I don't know. And I don't know why he chose these. Maybe you do. You can enlighten me. I don't know. Look at verse 22. But I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Why do we come to this place? Yep. You ever heard anybody, well, I don't have to go to church. I can worship God everywhere, anywhere. And to that you say? Well, it's shallow. I can worship God anywhere. I can worship God at home. I can worship God cutting grass, cutting trees, washing dishes. I can cut grass. I can, I, can, I can worship God singing. I can worship God driving. But you know, down here, we're supposed to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And there's something about worship with God's people that it's a, it, it's a team effort. And I'll, I'll tell you honest, today I've been... I'm, it's been a tough week on me, physically. Physically, it's been a tough week. And, um, but w when it comes to church, I'm coming to church. I mean, there's no question about that. But sometimes I come to church. You ever come to church and you didn't feel like it? I mean, physically, you didn't feel like it. But when you come to church, you get, you, we, we sang Happy uh, Grand Reunion Day. And, and and I, and, I, and I meet people, and I talked with Ernie and talked with some of the others. And, uh, there's something that's encouraging about that. Now, we need each other down here. We'll be together there. 
We don't need a place to go worship him there. And in our spirit, you remember in John 4 when he's talking to the, the woman at the well? Y'all remember that? And she's trying to bring up all the, well, you say that you worship God here. He said, there's coming a day. You're not going to worship God on the mountain. You're not going to worship the God over there. We're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what we're talking about. Whether you're on the new earth or whether you're in the new heaven, it, everywhere that you go will we'll have a, a constant understanding of the presence and the values and, and, the, and the wholeness of a holy God. That's what it means when he says the glory of the Lord is there. No temple for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Let me talk to you. I'm not going to take you to Revel, uh, Revelation 22 yet. But when we get to Revelation 22 verses 1 through 5, it'll talk about a river of life that flows. And it talks about God and it talks about Jesus, but it doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit. And in the river of life, surely that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. Surely it has to be, because there is the Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That doesn't, that's not going to be eliminated when we get to heaven. It's still going to be the three of it there, the one that flows from God. So here he says, the, here's the, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminates it. What we have now is is a reflection of light, something that comes from the sun or something that comes from the moon as it reflects that light. And it leaves shadows. But the glory of God is the light and there are no shadows. I'm looking over at Deborah right now. And we've got these chandeliers that bring forth the light as it does. And I, I, when I look beyond you, Deborah, I see the shadow of the, of the, of the pew on the wall. But the glory of God is everywhere. Where's the oxygen? Where's the oxygen? I mean, God's got us surrounded by it. Everywhere. On top of the pew, down below the pew, everywhere. We're engulfed in it. Right? It's everywhere. If we were in any place where oxygen would not, be, where oxygen was not, we would be in, a, in peril. Are y'all good with that? We have to have it. That's the best example I know of for the glory of God that we will have in heaven. It will be an, uh, everywhere in the glory of His presence. We're not looking for a shrine. Come on now. We're not looking for something that, that is an idolatrous thing. That's the temple. That's where we got to go. That's, no, no, no. That's, that's where we do it down here. When it should be flowing from our heart everywhere that we go. But we come together. There we'll be together. We'll always be together. The city had no need of the sun. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. I like that. We will walk in the light of the glory of God. That's what we should be practicing down here. Matter of fact, I think that's our purpose. Everything that we do, do should be for the glory of God. Everything that we do should be for his glory and honor down here on this earth. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. I said earlier, Dr. Lee said that what we would bring to heaven is music. I believe we're going to bring the glory and honor. That's what we're going to take to heaven. I don't know why God gives us what he gives us, but, but, but praise God, it comes from him. Is that right? So we bring him, we bring that to him. Sometimes in church we'll have a testimony service. It's been a while, hadn't it? And we'll testify of how good God is and what he's done for us. Amen. Give him glory. Give him glory. Spoke with a friend of mine this morning. Her husband 
is a dear friend of mine. He's uh, in a uh, hospital here in Gainesville. He has COVID. He, uh, they just moved him from 100% oxygen down to 90%. Basically, they're force, they were forcing him to have 100% oxygen. Now he's 10% breathing on his own, 90% oxygen coming to him, 10% of his own. Uh, and I, I, I went to write him a note yesterday. Fifth floor of the hospital is the COVID wing. And I went up there and I gave the note. I, I couldn't go to his room, obviously. Can't be in the presence of someone. I can't be in your presence if I'm, if I'm in their presence. But I, I, I wrote him a note and I just wanted him to know that his pastor friend loves him. And, and I, I, I was praying for him. So uh, his, and I, I called his wife yesterday to, just to let, him know, let her know. And uh, she called me this morning, and we're talking about it. And, and I don't know how we go from talking about sickness and pain and hardship and all that to talking about the glories and the splendor of the glory of God. That's just simply two people who love God that it just boils out. It just comes out of them. And God gets glory from that. Sometimes in my prayers, I say this. I want to put a smile on God's face. Lord, whatever we do, Make it make Satan just as angry as possible. But Lord, whatever we do, however we do what we do, may it put a smile on your face. I want to give him glory. I want to give him honor. I think we can add two. I think we can add two. A great orchestra of people who are redeemed, who are grateful. I think that's what witnessing is. I really do. When we, gave the, when, when we came up with this idea, if we're going to wear a mask, that we put on the mask, ask me about my greatest decision. Just ask me the greatest decision I've ever made. Listen to me. Listen to what I tell you. I think that's what we're supposed to do. I think that's, what we're, I think that's the greatest thing. Witnessing is not having to twist somebody's arm to... Maybe they'll get saved. You just tell them of the great and goodness of God and let God do the rest. It's not a chore to witness. It's not a chore to talk about the goodness of God to me. That's what heaven will be. I can't describe length. I can't describe the colors. I can't describe what your mansion's going to look like, your room. That is yours. I can't describe the new earth other than it will be pure with no trace of sin. It will have no sea in it whatsoever. No barriers in that place. We will move from the new heaven to the new earth, back and forth. How glorious. How wonderful. The permanence of it. To see people pure. The taste of everything being the most beautiful. People say, oh, there, there'll be no marriage. I promise you I'm going to be holding her hand. We'll, pay, we'll have our time. But, you know, marriage or giving in marriage and all those things, I can tell you from this point forward, the only thing that will matter is the relationship with God. But we're going to know each other. I'm going to know that that's my wife. I'm going to know that who my dad is and my grandfather is. I'm going to know that Jim's my friend. I'm going to know that Charles is my friend. Estranged relationships now, when they're bound together with the blood of Christ, become whole there, only pure, undefiled. That's not getting into Revelation 22. Sorry, I can't give you more descriptions of what heaven would be. If, if it's too much for Dr. Lee, it's definitely too much for Preacher Brian. Any questions? It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. That's all I can tell you. Lance, if you'll go turn all that off for me, please, sir. Thank you all for watching online. I hope you are 
uh, been blessed by it. All of the sermons will be on our website. You can go back and look at any of them you want to. You can share them with friends. Uh, just go to newhollandbc.org and you'll find them there. All right? Let me pray real quick and we'll talk about our prayer list. Lord Jesus, I love you and I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for salvation. I'm grateful that I said yes. I'm grateful that you said yes to me first. I pray for perspective, Lord, because we're still, 1 Corinthians 13, we're still looking in a glass darkly. But then, face to face. I pray, Lord, that we'll have the ability to serve you with the heart that you've given us. I pray that we'll serve you well. Thank you for keeping our loved ones safe with you until the day that we will, oh, glory, be with you. Lord, my heart just aches for those who blindly walk in their own light rather than humbling themselves and walking in yours. We need your help, Lord. We, we want to be on mission for you. Lord, help us to be the witnesses of your beauty and your glory that we should be and we need to be. Help us never to be ashamed of the one who did so much for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.